is a professor emeritus at Northwest College, uh, taught English for a good number of years. Uh, I've known Rob for um, probably over 30 years uh, easily, and I have been enjoying his photography with birds uh, via the internet in the um, Instagram for a good number of years, so I'm pleased to have him. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob. I'm going to mute my uh, microphone and encourage others to do that as well. And hopefully when we get done, we'll have some time for questions. So if you want to add your questions to the chat, uh, we'll go ahead and read them off when we get to that point. Rob, take it away. Okay, Hans, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Hans for offering me the opportunity to give this presentation. I love photographing birds, but I also love to share my photography. And I like to talk about photographing birds. So my hope is that you will find uh, this discussion and these comments uh, interesting. This afternoon, I'm gonna mention two people who have had a great deal of influence on my approach to photographing birds, Jay Mizell and David Sibley. Part of the title of this presentation is taken from Jay Mizell's book, It's Not About the F-Stop. In the start of his book, he writes in his introduction, most instructive photographic books tend to dwell a great deal on technique and equipment. This one doesn't. One of my best friends, Sam Garcia, and I argue endlessly over differing perceptions of photography. Recently, he said photography is not about photography. It's about everything else. I asked, did you make that up? He said, yes. I said, I think that's the best thing I've ever heard. And in this book, I tried to talk about everything else. So I'm going to um, hang on. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of some of his suggestions, but basically his approach is how to see the photograph uh, that you're gonna end up taking. David Sibley is the author and illustrated, illustrator of an internationally known guidebook on birds. I think I lived in Powell, Wyoming for some 20 years before I became interested in bird photography. During that time, I remember seeing few birds, a few robins now and then, maybe some sparrows foraging around campus and once a pair of sandhill cranes though I didn't know what they were at the time. Sibley's book uh, on his guide to book to birds and what it's like to be a bird, I would recommend both highly. In his preface to what it's like to be a bird, he says, one of the themes that impressed me throughout my work on this book is that a bird's experience is far richer more complex, more thoughtful than I imagined. And if that was news to me after a lifetime of watching birds, it must be surprising to other people as well. Now, a number of years ago, we were fortunate enough to get David Sibley out on campus. We got him out here by using bait, which is uh, this fellow here, which is a sage grouse. He had never had the opportunity to watch sage grouse in the spring when they're mating. And so I promised to take him to a lek to uh, show him the activity on the sage grouse. By the way, this is a pretty um, controversial bird. It happens to uh, it happens to live in prime oil and natural gas habitat. And so uh, the well-being of the bird and balancing that against the, uh, the, the oil uh, 
extraction is something that's a little bit um, tough at times. At any rate, while Sibley was out here, I took him around to see what kind of birds that we could, could find. And uh, it was a privilege and an educational experience to take him around where I saw a bunch of ducks. He saw seven different species, including two which didn't normally hang out together. One comment that he made to me has stuck with me. Whenever anyone asks me to identify a bird, the first question I ask is, where did you see it? Because birds are closely tied to habitat. By the same token, understanding habitat can help you not only ID birds, but it can also help you find them in the first place. Now, Hans mentioned a lot of this, but I first became interested in photography when I was in college in 1968. Back in those days, we used something called film. And the computer has since replaced that, which has allowed me to move into the area of photography. I graduated from a small liberal arts college in North Carolina, then ended up at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, where I earned a PhD in American Lit. And from there, I ended up teaching English at Northwest College, a community college in the small town of Powell, Wyoming. I started digital photography in the 90s to take photos of my kids. And then when the kids left home, I switched to wildlife and landscape photography. In spite of the wealth of photo opportunities around me, I eventually came to focus on birds. Now, Powell, Wyoming is in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming. Uh, and as I said, there's no shortage of photographic opportunities. Yellowstone National Park is uh, about an hour and a half to the west. The Bighorn Mountains are about an hour to the east. And there's a lot of interesting terrain in between there. All things considered, it's right pretty territory. We once had someone come uh, for a visit, a speaker, and he said, you know, we've come to realize that when somebody out here says it's right pretty over there, they mean that it's just drop dead gorgeous. And there is a lot of beautiful country like that. One of uh, Jay Mizell's maxims is always look behind you. And that's awfully good advice. Um, I happened to glance in the rear view mirror while we were leaving Yellowstone. Uh, for a day trip and realized that this was a site worth pulling over. So it's something that I always try to keep in mind. Uh, try to be sensitive to what's going on around you. It's not just the landscape. There is a lot of wildlife out here too um, that attracts photographers from all over the world. The grizzlies are pretty common. They're spreading out of the park and getting closer to town. Um, bighorn sheep uh, are common, particularly between Cody and the park. I was taking photos of bighorn sheep when my friend John Campbell, who was with me, said, you know, there's an eagle on the river behind us. So I turned around and checked, and lo and behold, there was a lovely uh, eagle sitting on a branch. So I when I pulled a U-turn, came back, so I was able to uh, get a shot out the window at the eagle and managed to get a nice shot of the eagle in flight. So there are also elk out here. We often call them the mega mammals. They're what really attract photographers. But going into the park and photographing up there does have some drawbacks. People, um, we see a lot of behavior that is, uh, is foolish at best. And trying to deal with other people while photographing in a place like Yellowstone can ruin your day. Uh, there are common occurrences of uh, bison 
tossing tourists and people try to keep track of it, figure out what the score is for any for any given day. And uh, there, there's a lot of behavior that is simply hazardous. So instead of fighting the crowds, I tend to go toward the ugly part of Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin. I stick to farmland and arid scrublands. Uh, and while the subjects may be smaller, so are the crowds. In fact, there aren't any, and that's what makes uh, much of my photography possible. I, one of the points that I wanna make is that one of the advantages of bird photography is that it is available virtually everywhere. And if op opportunities can exist in a place that uh, has uh, pretty wretched weather a lot of times, then it can, uh, it can exist in a lot of different places. For me, successful bird photography is three basic elements, equipment, expertise, both with the equipment and with the birds, and luck. And I like the definition of luck as opportunity meets preparation. This afternoon, I'm gonna touch on just briefly equipment, a technical matter or two, general habitats in the Bighorn Basin, techniques and procedures, and a bit on post-processing. My hope is that this should take about 45 minutes. And we'll have time for questions uh, at the end. As we all know, the devil is in the details, so I'd like to mention a few technical details. The camera I use is a Nikon D850 with a 500 millimeter Nikon phase Fresno lens. The reason that I mention that is that that is a fairly new lens in the Nikon lineup. And the advantage that it has is that it's, it's small and it's light. And when I'm whipping the camera around trying to track birds, it's nice to have that. It has a 40 megapixel sensor, which is nice because since my subjects are small, and often far away, I do end up cropping a lot. And generally speaking, I, I shoot with shutter priority with a shutter speed of 1 3200th if possible. Now, finding birds can be a more important and difficult issue sometimes than one might think. The general habitats I'm gonna be talking about, uh, backyard, roadside, poles and wires, fences and posts, roadside shoulders and fields, ditches, streams, ponds, and wetlands. Now, a backyard can be a prime habitat for birds and a great location for bird photography. House sparrows, house finches, pine siskins, goldfinches, nuthatches, and a variety of other birds are attracted to backyard feeders. It's a good way to practice photographing them in a controlled environment. Small birds, except for hummingbirds, birds, are much harder to capture in flight than larger birds. And this, this gives you an opportunity to play with shutter speed and see what you're gonna get. Not everyone has a backyard, of course. And even if you do, you may not have many visitors. But if you have some shrubs and trees, and you can provide food and provide water, you'll have visitors pretty soon. Now, a backyard can be a good place to sit and watch. Maisel likes to say that when we set out to do some photography, we shouldn't be so focused on getting a certain image or photographing a certain subject that we miss other opportunities that come our way. Even the ordinary and the commonplace can become fascinating subjects. And as Sibley pointed out, the behavior of birds can be varied and intriguing. This is a grackle. Grackles don't have a real positive reputation. They're not real popular birds. And yet the light was good on his head. He happened to be sitting in the crab apple when it was in blossom. Uh, it makes for an interesting photo. 
by the same token, the behavior, preening, um, stretching their feathers, getting everything arranged, I thought presented nice symmetry here for this image. Even ordinary birds, when they're engaged in something like nest building, provide an opportunity. So I think at least as far as I am concerned, uh, one of the key elements in photographing birds is staying open to opportunities. They often happen where we least expect them. Will Rogers once said, it ain't what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know that ain't so. In some ways, I'm fortunate that I don't know very much. But I did know when I was taking pictures of this uh, dove that the light was pretty bad. But my attitude is what the hell, you don't get anything if you don't press the shutter. So it's worth taking risks and it's worth photographing at times when things are less than ideal. People talk about the, old, the golden hours, the uh, early in the morning and late in the afternoon when the light tends to be at its best. But I also find that many times I run across really interesting photos when the light is, is, is not good at all. So it's, it, I believe, is worth keeping in mind. The same thing goes with bird behavior. I was watching a black-capped chickadee. In the winter, these guys eat seeds mainly. But in the summer, they shift to insects. And I noticed one behaving a little differently, fluttering around in the, uh, in the cottonwood tree in the, in the backyard. Um, and I realized then that what it was doing was eating aphids off of the cottonwood uh, leaves. And then because it was slightly backlit, it gave me an opportunity to capture this with the wings spread, which uh, I find um, uh, found as, as a really attractive image. There are other ways of attracting birds than using bird feeders. Um, I like to photograph hummingbirds. We only see them for oh, three or four weeks in late July and August. So encourage, in, to encourage them as they're passing through on their migration, we have planted a variety of perennials uh, that attract hummingbirds. Um, they like red flowers, they like trumpet-shaped flowers. And so I, um, I, I have a number of those that uh, the planted to attract them. The other thing that has worked pretty well is to, uh, to order or to put annuals in potted plants, set them out on a deck. You can actually buy collections of plants designed to attract hummingbirds. And they have the advantage, once again, of getting you a fixed area that you can focus on, uh, a way that you can um, uh, be prepared when the hummingbirds buzz through. The other nice thing about using potted plants like this is you can always move them around to vary the background. And in this case, I moved the pot in front of some daisies to give a, a uh, the yellow in the, in, in the background. One of the things that I've learned about hummingbirds um, is they, they don't like bees very much. Uh, by the way, the thing that's, one of the things that's interesting in this photo is you can see the hummingbird's tongue sticking out. Uh, hummingbird tongues are amazing pieces of engineering. Uh, they actually kind of curl up uh, behind their skull and uh, uh, 
anyway, they're, they're quite interesting. So this is an example of luck. Fortunately, I had my camera settings so that I could uh, freeze the motion here. The B is on what is known as a ball thistle. So the hummingbird came up and you, you can see them um, uh, opening their beaks. Uh, hummingbirds, by the way, don't live on nectar alone. They need protein, so they're omnivorous. They eat insects. And the first time I saw a hummingbird open its mouth, I was really surprised at that. Anyway, this fellow comes in and reaches down and grabs the bee by the wing and then lifts it up and tosses it away. It was one of the more interesting um, sequences that I had managed to get with hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, if you really want to freeze a hummingbird, a lot of people use a flash. I prefer not to use a flash because uh, I don't mind a little movement in there. So I believe the setting on this was uh, 32 hundredths, one thirty-two hundredths. So that does a pretty good job of freezing a lot of the uh, activity. Well, if you have a lot of songbirds in your backyard, a lot of small birds, the opportunity, the, uh, the possibility is that sooner or later, one of these guys will show up. This happens to be a sharp-shinned hawk. They are notorious for um, living in the back or for eating songbirds that are attracted to, to bird feeders. So speaking of hawks, move out of the backyard. I do a lot of driving around in the agricultural lands around Powell. Powell, by the way, is pretty small, about 5,500 people. Um, I usually stay in my rolling bird blind, which is a Toyota Tundra. And I do most of this photography from the truck. And that's why being on sparsely traveled roads uh, is really useful. Rough-legged hawk, they migrate down from Canada in the winter and they're very common. The joke goes that the telephone pole is Wyoming's official tree. Uh, once you get out of the mountains of Wyoming, there just aren't many trees except along the, the rivers. Uh, you get cottonwoods. So telephone poles are a, a common place to look for, for, uh, for the birds. This is a prairie falcon who happens to have a starling. So once again, when I'm out and about looking, I'm looking for opportunities that, uh, well, I just keep an eye on the top of the telephone poles or on the telephone lines. This is an American kestrel, a uh, very small falcon. And it is, um, uh, uh, pretty good hunter. And a lot, of, a lot of times if I see a solitary bird in between two telephone poles, my first thought is it's probably a kestrel. They hunt from that position. Uh, they see an ultraviolet. And I gather that mouse urine will fluoresce in ultraviolet. So they sit up there looking for the tracks that the mice have left and then uh, and then going after them. So not only telephone poles, <clears throat> but also um, fence posts. And I always like it when I can get a uh, wooden fence post uh, as opposed to a metal one. I just think it looks better. This is a Merlin. It the Merlin is a little. Is, it's another small hawk, a little bit larger 
than the kestrel. Uh, but not all hawks. This is a meadow lark, which are great to listen to. By the way, I go back to another kestrel here. He was sitting on a fence post uh, when I saw him and uh, decided to take off with his mouse. Barn swallows will often, as they're feeding over the fields, return to the barbed wire and uh, feed the youngins there. Goldfinch, once again, a goldfinch uh, by the roadside. Um, I don't know that I mentioned this before, but I think at one point, Jay Mizell in his book says, it's not about the f-stop. And then later on, he says, except when it is. This is a case where a narrow depth of field, I think enhances the photo because it uh, really allows the focus to go on the, on the goldfinch, which has been feeding on dead sunflowers there. Now, moving from fence lines to fields, come to pheasants, uh, although this one is on the road, I was actually photographing some eagles in a tree. I was pulled off to the side of the road when this fellow walked by. And once again, I didn't think a photo of a pheasant in a road would turn out particularly well, but this is often the case. I was surprised. This is what a normal shot of mine of a pheasant looks like they can disappear into a small clump of vegetation as quickly and as thoroughly as uh, virtually anything I've ever seen. And it really is kind of a disappearing act. Now, last winter, at the end of the winter, I realized that pheasants usually prefer to run when they can, and they don't run very well in snow. So the last time, well, a couple of weeks ago, we had a pretty good snow. So I made it a point to get out and see what I could find in the way of pheasants. And this one, I managed to get walking to me. And I like the way the eyes look. He looks just a little bit cranky and irritated about life in general. So... The snow is a good opportunity then to catch them in flight because they're not gonna run. So what I ended up doing was finding a field where pheasants were kicking the snow aside so they could get to the corn underneath it. And then I would pull up and stop and I had to be ready to shoot in uh, uh, seconds, usually one or two because they would take off pretty quickly. But it was fortunate, for one thing, I had the snow as a white background, and it was able to get uh, to have some opportunities uh, to catch them in flight. Opportunities that I have to say that normally uh, I wouldn't have had. Now, to make a transition from pheasants, which you expect to find in uh, a, a place of fields uh, to bald eagles. There are a lot of bald eagles around and that's something that came as a bit of a surprise to me because I just don't associate or I didn't associate bald eagles with uh, fallow farm fields. I always thought of them around lakes or streams. But I realized, I learned pretty quickly that around Powell, there was a powerful attractor for bald eagles, and that would be sheep. In the winter, uh, farmers bring uh, feeder sheep down from Montana, graze them on the fields, many of which have beet tops from the sugar beet crop, and eagles will gather. They don't kill 
the sheep necessarily, the bald eagles that is, unless uh, I have heard they will take lambs, but most of the time what they're doing is waiting for a sheep to fall ill and die. And when that happens, <clears throat> eagles as scavengers uh, will gather uh, around, around the carcass. And often it's quite a few. I've seen as many as 15 or 17 in a particular tree near a uh, down sheep. Now, you get into an issue of cropping here, and it's something that I'm going to talk about a little bit at the end of this presentation. You can get a nice photo of the eagles. For one thing, you can see them gathering here. They're pretty social. And when you hear them talking to one another, they have a pretty ungodly squawk. Uh, but it is, um, you don't have to include the photos of the dead sheep. So, so cropping and uh, uh, focusing on something like this gives you an opportunity to see a lot of, uh, a, a lot of different things. Once again, I like to catch images of them in flight. You might notice the coloration. I don't know if you're uh, aware of this or not, but an eagle, bald eagle's head does not turn white until they're about five years old. So when they're younger, there is a pretty good range of coloration in the, um, in the head and, and, and in the body. So eagles are something that I greatly enjoy uh, taking photos of and I do it uh, primarily, I'm able to do it primarily because um, it, uh, uh, because of the sheep. Although yesterday I did drive over to, uh, to the east of us to the Yellowtail Lake and it's still frozen, but I saw eight bald eagles clustered together in the, on the ice. As one of them had caught a fish. And this is where the disadvantage of taking photos from a truck comes in. By the time I was able to get turned around and get to a point where I thought I could stop and take a photo, I looked in the rear view mirror and there was a large ore truck bearing down on me. So I missed that particular opportunity. But sandhill cranes also frequent this area. And they arrived last week, although obviously this is an image that, uh, that came uh, from last fall. <clears throat> I have a friend who likes to say that when you're photographing something like wildlife, you need to decide whether you want to focus on the soloist or the orchestra. Do you want a photo of an individual? or do you want the photo of the context? So in this case, I like the context of the sandhill cranes standing in the field watching the combine harvest the corn. Here's another example of uh, looking at a group or uh, a, a crowd of birds that gives you something of the context and what they're doing is feeding in an, an irrigation ditch. But there's a great deal of pleasure in taking the image, doing a photograph of, uh, of, of the bird in flight. And I particularly enjoy that. This is another case, however, of uh, understanding a little bit about behavior and habitat helps you to get a photo. I know that cranes often will spend much of the day down near the river or working on some fields and then they relocate to another area where they're going to spend the night. 
and I happened to know where one of those areas were so that it allowed me to set up in the late evening and catch photos or in the morning when they were leaving and catch photos of the cranes as they were heading out. They often fly quite low, so it gives you an opportunity for, uh, for, for a good shot. I mentioned earlier that it's easier to take a photo of a large bird than a, a small bird. It's really tough to get a picture of a sparrow in flight. It's not so hard at all to get a picture of a sandhill crane. They move more slowly, they glide, they, uh, they really have a, um, a beautiful uh, movement to them. Now, one last area that I'm gonna mention briefly in terms of habitat has to do with, uh, with wetlands and waters. This is, this is a Virginia rail and the chick. Um, it's just another area that I try to keep in mind. This one was down near the Shoshone River. This is a Sora, once again, a, uh, a, a fairly um, uh, secretive bird. This one was in an irrigation ditch though. I was surprised to see that. And this is a Wilson's snipe, once again, in some agricultural, uh, you know, in an area that drains agricultural fields and has a year round flow. So those are areas that I always try to head up when I'm looking for birds to photograph. In terms of techniques, I've mentioned some of these things. Most of the time I shoot from my rolling bird blind, a Toyota Tundra. I drive mostly on gravel roads and two tracks. I drive with my camera and my lap. I drive with one eye on the road, one eye on the rear view mirror, one eye on the tops of telephone poles, one eye on telephone wires, one eye on the fields, and one eye on the fence posts along the road. I try to remember to check my settings before I leave the driveway. All of these things become important to capturing a bird in flight. And I might add, I don't, uh, I, I'm happy if I can find a place to stay put and let the birds come to me. Uh, but a lot of times driving around gives me an opportunity to spot more than I would have seen. Now, I talked earlier about um, birds on the top of telephone poles and particularly with catching birds in flight. When I see an opportunity, I try to get as close as I can uh, without spooking the bird. The best time to capture a bird in flight is as they are launching or right after they launch. I shoot in burst mode, about nine frames per second. At liftoff, birds have their wings and feathers spread for maximum lift. At liftoff, birds are moving their slopes. And also notice that in this particular red tail hawk, the head and back and tail bend to form the shape of an airfoil, another technique to generate lift. I get most of my best birds in flight photos in the first two or three seconds after a bird launches. So I've got to be ready. Another red tail hawk, notice the spread of the wings, the spread of the tail for maximum lift. Once again, another red tail. All of these were taken very soon 
after launching. This is a rough-legged hawk. I was delighted to see one in a tree instead of on a telephone pole. They're called rough-legged hawks, by the way, in case you're not familiar with them, because of the feathers that extend down to their ankles. They spend uh, most of their time in the Arctic. In the winter, they come south, but in the summer, they, they go back up to the Arctic where they breed. another rough-legged hawk. And again, you can see the pattern of the wing spread and the tail spread. It gives you uh, a nice view. This one is a prairie falcon in flight. And I have to say, I was happy with this photo because these guys are tough. Um, they're small and they're fast. And they um, they're they're pretty hard to, to to get to get a handle on. So, uh, by the way, this is a golden eagle. Uh, we have golden eagles and bald eagles. Bald eagles tend to be more social. Golden eagles tend to be uh, more solitary. The I mentioned that the gold the bald eagles tend to not to, uh, to kill full grown sheep, but bald eagles can. As a matter of fact, they can kill antelope and deer. They are pretty fierce predators. Now, a note on post-processing. By the way, this is another instance uh, or following Maisel's point of don't be so focused on taking one kind of photo that you miss another opportunity. I was taking shots of sandhill cranes coming in for the night. This is during fire season in the, uh, late summer and fall when forest fires in the mountains get going and the, the, the whole area is inundated with smoke. But I was set up and waiting for the uh, for cranes to come in, and as the sun was setting, in terms of trying to capture a picture of the cranes, it was pretty wretched. The um, the light was directly in my my face. Uh, the subjects were terribly backlit, but then I got to thinking, geez, Heart Mountain, which is that mountain in the in the background looks pretty interesting. So maybe I'll see what I can get uh, with that. And I turned out an image that I was pretty pleased with. When I come back from an outing shooting at uh, shooting birds, I often will have a screen that this is just part of the number of images that, that come out. To me, one of the most interesting things about bird photography is editing the image, the post-processing that I get. But a lot of times it becomes uh, difficult to choose which image I might want to use. There's a, a, a composition feature that I used to, uh, to follow. Um, who always used to say when you're trying to generate ideas, he was a proponent of something called free writing, where you write down your ideas as rapidly as possible without editing. He said, when you're looking over that, look for something that surprises you. And I find for me that often works with photography. When I'm looking for images, I'm often attracted to the image that surprises me, that contains something that I wasn't looking for and didn't necessarily expect to see. So I, I, I think that something worth keeping in mind, the editing is as important as taking the picture. Now, there's a quote 
that I want to read that is probably subject for another discussion. Um, but it's from a book called The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. LaRue. And the quote goes, there's this family photo, he says, not the one in the hall, this other one from back when I was six or seven. That day was awful. Muriel put gum in David's book and I had a cold and my parents were fighting right up until the flash went off. And in the photo, we all look so happy. I remember seeing that picture and realizing that photographs weren't real. There's no context, just the illusion that you're showing a snapshot of a life. But life isn't snapshots, it's fluid. So photos are like fiction. I love that about them. Everything, everyone thinks that photography is truth, but it's just a very convincing lie. Now, when we start talking about editing photos, there's a lot of discussion about what is appropriate and what is inappropriate to do. I think that that's going to be an ongoing prob, uh, discussion. I almost said problem. But when you edit a photo, you inherently change the nature of it. So just as a matter of cropping and uh, dealing with your color balances, you get a very different image between the, um, between the raw file and the one that, that comes up. The same thing in this case of an eagle in flight, the before with the raw file, when you crop in, you get a completely different image that goes on there. So I, um, I sometimes remove things from a photo. I'll remove a telephone wire. I'll remove a, a branch or a twig. I don't do anything like that if I'm submitting uh, for a composition or if the image is supposed to be a news image, then that's something that you have to be very careful about. But I do believe that the editing of the image, uh, particularly if the image is for aesthetic purposes, is something that is really important. Well, I am about at the end of my time. So I will um, close this out. And then if anybody has any questions, I will be happy to entertain them. And folks can put them in the chat or if they want to unmute and just ask the question, either would be fine. By the way, thank you for uh, your time here today, Rob. This is wonderful. Um, I, I have a question I could ask. Um, is there a particular bird that you are always excited to see? Uh, over um, you know, when you go out on a day, it's uh, is there something that's always fun to see? Boy, that's an interesting question. Uh, I find myself really locked into the rhythms of their migration patterns. So in the summer, I'm always delighted when the first hummingbird shows up. By the time I've taken 20 or 30,000 hummingbird photos, I'm not as excited. The same thing happens with me with bald eagles. The bald eagles really come in in, in late fall, around Thanksgiving. It's, uh, it's, it's great to see them. But once again, after 30 or 40,000 photos, 
you know, I'm ready to move on. The Sandhill Cranes, I'm delighted that the cranes are here. And um, it is, uh, um, uh, it is, so, so it goes like that. And I suppose the thing, anything that is unusual, a little bit mm -hmm. out of the ordinary is something that's uh, really, really exciting for me. We have a question from Nancy that says, how close did you get to that uh, image of the last owl there? The last owl, I was probably, I was at the bottom of the tree and he wasn't very high up. He was in a Russian olive tree. Um, so my guess would be that I was probably 20 feet, 15 feet. It, that photo was interesting. I just almost didn't take it because I knew it wouldn't turn out. Um, it was in very dark shade. The sky was bright behind it. I knew that the, the, the angle was so uh, steep that it was gonna be hard to see anything, but you know what the hell, I took it and it surprised me. I got some, uh, I was able to zero in on the eyes and they it turned out quite well. So Rob, your, um, uh, your neighbor, Ken Fulton, um, you know, talking about photo opportunities, you'll be familiar with the area as would uh, Hans going to Billings out by the lime plant. And so it came upon like, I'm assuming was a dead coyote alongside the road. And this eagle was actually hovered over the whole thing, spread its whole wings out. You know, and there was a hawk sitting on the fence post, you know, across the road from him. And, and you know, one of those opportunities lost, you might say. But well, I tell you, hey, that's where luck comes in. You need both that and nobody behind you on the road. Right. Uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, because, <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff I love to see. Mm -hmm. Harry asks, is there a part of the country that you'd like to visit to see a certain bird? You know, I have, um, I've gone a couple of times to Kearney, Nebraska for the Sand Hill Crane migration. And that is uh, flat out wonderful. And I've also gone down in New Mexico, the Bosque de la Pache to see the Sand Hill Cranes there, but my timing was off and they had, I beat them down there. Um, so, but it, it, it is a, a, an interesting thing. I've been tempted to go to the Saks Zem Bog, if anybody has heard of that um, in, in Wisconsin. They have a lot of uh, snowy owls there and that I think would be pretty wonderful. But when I travel, if I'm gonna be staying in a place, I often will Google bird watching opportunities and put the name of the town in. And it's amazing how many places uh, the local bird watchers will have identified as good bird watching spots. It's great to be able to do that. So I'm an equal opportunity uh, shooter. Abby asks, what ISO do you prefer to shoot at? Boy, I would like something really low, but I don't ever get that opportunity. Um, I, I start off at 800 and depending on the uh, clouds and the light condition, I'll, I'll go to 1,000 or 1,200. The problem is of course noise. Um, and the higher you go with your ISO, the more noise you're gonna get. And uh, it's not just the ISO, it's also how much you're having to crop. So even something at a rare, fairly reasonable ISO, if you have to crop way in, you can lose clarity and details with the, with the, the film. Nancy has a statement that says uh, uh, the owl. So that's why you said that it was uh, digital that gave you the opportunity and the impetus to be a photographer. Well, digital, um, 
Some of you <clears throat> may remember the days where you took your film down to the drugstore and dropped it off and or the little kiosk. If you wanted to, um, if you wanted to be serious about photography, you really needed a, a dark room. Um, I remember taking photos and waiting to get them back and looking at the little snapshot that came back and thinking, oh hell, you know, I wanted it to look like the National Geographic and instead it didn't look like there wasn't anything in that universe. But the computer gives me, uh, uh, it's the dark room, gives you the opportunity to uh, produce something uh, immediately in there, so. Christine uh, says, how has your approach to photography, photographing birds changed over time as you've gotten more experience observing their habits and life cycles? Uh, it's interesting. I, I think I'm able to predict where I might have opportunities in ways that I hadn't been able to do that. I have, I don't flail around as much with um, trying to figure out what the right f-stop is going to be, uh, what the right shutter speed is going to be. Those things become less um, time consuming for me. Uh, and I, I suppose mainly um, it's it's a matter of an, uh, of, of anticipating um, what possibilities are out there. Chester states that for those of us living in Indiana and are on Facebook, birding in Indiana is a great group to follow. I will take a peek at that. I um, post most of my stuff on Facebook and. It's just a good way to share with an audience and it's a great way to learn what's, what's going on, what's available. Well, we are almost out of time here. So Rob, thank you so much for your effort and uh, Oh, Zach says, if you'd like to watch the recording of this live stream, you can find it on YouTube. And he provides the, the address. Uh, so uh, HTTPS uh, colon forward slash YouTube BE forward slash Q capital B capital T TA dash three U capital E S capital E. So. God <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Thank you, uh, this is a real treat for me. I do appreciate it. Good. Good. Okay. Well, have a good day. Happy photography. Thank you.